morning. Our opening uh, sentence is found on page 123 as well as your readings lesson handout. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Continuing on page 124, I invite you to join with me in the colic or prayer for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Nice. 
Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your grace that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We may be seated for the lessons. The first reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 4, followed by verses 9 through 15. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat down by the meat pots, and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out of the wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in the law or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. In the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord God has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. The psalm selected for this morning is Psalm 78, verses 14 through 26, to be read responsibly. 
Psalm 78. We shall read responsibly by half verse. He divided the sea and let them go through. He made the waters to stand in a heap. In the daytime he led them with a cloud, and all the night through with the light of fire. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance at some great deep. He brought waters out of the stony rock so that it gushed out like the scripture. Yet for all this they sinned more against him and provoked the most high in the wilderness. They tested God in their hearts and demanded food for their craving. They spoke against God, saying, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Indeed, he smote the stony rock so that the water gushed out and the streams overflowed. But can he give bread also? Provide meat for his people. When the Lord heard this, he was full of wrath. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and there flared a fierce anger against Israel. Because they did not believe in God, and did not put their trust in his help. So he commanded the clouds above, and opened the doors of heaven. He ran down manna upon them to eat, and gave them. So mortals ate the bread of angels. For he sent them the second reading this morning is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led an hour of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who ascended, who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and, all, and, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waters and carried about by every wind and doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up every, in every way to him, and to him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would please stand for the reading of the Lord's Gospel. The Holy Gospel by Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, 
Truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please join with me in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come and feed us. Feed us by the abundance of your grace and love. Nourish us in mind, body, and soul and equip us to do the work of the gospel, to build up the church, and to spread the good news of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. As I was preparing for this homily, I got quite tickled. Because, um, and I'm not going to single uh, Michael out in any way whatsoever. <laughs> But he often jokes with me about my slight obsession with food. I've been known to even photograph the stuff. And so, Michael, I have a joke for you and everyone else to suffer through. What do you call a fake noodle? An impasta. Perhaps I should continue now with the sermon. <laughs> if you think about it, though, seriously... The lessons today are a lot about food. They pop up all over the place. In fact, I searched, I did search through the epistle, and I decided it too can be about food because it talks about nourishing the body. And that happens through food, does it not? Both the real, the real stuff and then that stuff that we fix, those things that we prepare. But let's talk about the situation that we, quite frankly, are people that are starving for food. Now, you can look at me and say, my friend, you don't appear to be starving. I I'm talking deeper and richer than the things that we set on our table. I'm talking about the true spiritual food. Uh, reading the last part of the gospel, for instance, brought to my mind the discuss discussion with Jesus and the woman at the well. I have plenty of uh, water, the water that never gives out. And she says, sir, I'd like some of that. I think the inference is, is I'm tired of lugging water around. Give me the water that never runs out. And he shares with her, he is that water. And that's captured in our gospel where he's the food, he's the nourishment, and the water of life. So let's look at our situation first and foremost as people who are starving spiritually for the spiritual food. We see that in the first lesson from Exodus. It's one of those lessons that quite frankly, is a lesson, if you think about it, of, of condemnation. God has brought his people out of slavery, out of bondage, quite frankly, out of genocide. Remember, the edict from Pharaoh was that every male-born Hebrew child was to be killed. This was the extermination of the Hebrew people that was going on in slavery in Egypt. And God heard their cries. He heard their pleas. He answered them and he sent Moses and Aaron 
and, and Miriam. And he brought them out of slavery toward the promised land. And so here they are on their way to the promised land, having to go through the desert regions, if you will, and they start doing something that's pretty rough and dangerous in the church. They start to grumble. They start to complain. They start to question the motives of God. And that comes very dangerously close to the unforgivable sin. Because when you question God's motives, that you doubt that what he offers you is salvation, you doubt what he offers you is good for you, then you will reject it. And without God's grace and mercy, we are lost. And so they come dangerously close to that. It says at the beginning of the, of the reading today, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. But the reality is, and God uh, reveals it clearly to, to Moses, they're not really grumbling against you, Moses. They're really complaining about me. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? That's the question that's getting asked in the psalm for today. And so when you reflect on the psalm, what happens? It, in many ways, recounts what God has done for his people. That he's heard their prayers. He's heard their cries. He's delivering them from slavery toward the freedom of the promised land. But what happens? Verse 18 for, for all this day, they, for all this, they sinned more against him. They provoked the Most High in the wilderness. They tested God in their hearts. And they demanded food for their craving. The people spoke against God saying, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? We have the beautiful verse from verse 24, 26. So mortals ate the bread of angels, for he sent them food enough. But in the context, wow, we have rebellion against God. We have doubt against God and his intent. We have anger displayed against God. And God's response to that is grace. When mortals eat the bread of angels, God has provided for their needs. But they have also angered God. Because that's what happens any time you call someone a liar. Or any time you say that your intent my, is that of an enemy and not of a friend. And even much more so if we were to say that to the Lord God Almighty. And if you look at the reading from the gospel today, it's rather confrontational, isn't it? The people, and this is a continuation of the readings we've been having, but the people are seeking Jesus, and when they find him, his response in verse 26 is, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves of bread. In other words, you found the granddaddy of free food and you want me to keep feeding you and providing for your material needs. And Jesus did not come to provide to, for our material needs, although I would quickly add, he does. But he came to provide for that which we really need, his grace, his mercy, his salvation, his gift from the cross. And so in this conversation with the people who've come to receive more food, he offers something that's quite beautiful. He reminds them and he reminds us of who he is. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. Verse 33. And then verse 35, another beautiful example of God's grace. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. 
Now, in talking about these lessons today in our Bible study before uh, worship, one of the things that we talked about is how, quite frankly, human beings, for all of our intelligence and all of our accomplishments, we do need it put pretty simply for us. We need something tangible. And so God gives us the tangible nature of food. It is not by accident that Jesus chose at the Last Supper to talk about what he was going to do on the cross. He takes bread. He gives thanks to God. He breaks it. He distributes it to his disciples. And he says, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he takes the cup, the chalice of wine. It too is passed around. Drink this in remembrance. He gives us a meal. And every Sunday we gather around the Lord's table. Yes, it's called an altar. But it's also more than appropriate to refer to it as the Lord's table. We are part of a family of God. A family that gathers weekly at the table of the Lord. To hear those words, to have it repeated again in its most simple form, that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, and he wants us to enact this, this little meal. And anyone who's ever tasted a wafer <laughs> or had a sip of wine, it is indeed a little meal. You're not going to get your full here physically. But I pray to God every Sunday that you get your full spiritually. Because he's using this little meal to invite us to the heavenly banquet. Where it is true as Jesus declared in the gospel, he's the bread of life. And those who come to him shall never hunger. Those who believe in him shall never thirst. And that's captured in this ceremony of the Eucharist. An invitation simply to dine in fellowship with the Lord God Almighty and with each other. So we've looked at the rebellious, rebelliousness of the people. We looked at the doubt of the people. Can God prepare a table? Can he prepare a table for us in the wilderness? And indeed he does. And Jesus prepares a table to feed the 5,000 and the 7,000 in the wilderness, so to speak. He feeds them, sure enough. But how about in our lives today where we're spiritually hungry? Perhaps we're suffering in one way or another. Perhaps we have physical or, or other needs or things that are going on in our life that makes it look like the world is spending around us and passing us by. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness for us, for you and for me? And of course the answer is yes. And in the Ephesians, Paul talks about what it looks like to be a member of the body of Christ, to be one of those who are chosen by God to be his son, his daughter, to be part of the body and family of God. And so he says to the church, to you and to me, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And then he gives us an example. If we have the example of grumbling, if we have the example of complaining, if we have the example of doubting, we need a counter counter example. We need an antidote. And here Paul gives it to us laid out very simp simply. He says that if we're going to walk in the manner worthy of our calling, we're going to be humble. There it is in verse 2. All humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. You know that's one of the reasons we come to church. We come to church to worship God, right? Yes. We come to church to, to hear his word, to have the scriptures. We come to church to pray. We come to church to participate in the Lord's Supper. But we also come to church to grow in patience <laughs> and those parts that, well, quite frankly, sometimes challenge us to bear with one another. 
Not everybody is like us. Not everybody thinks the same way we do. And it is in the church community that we actually have to practice love with those that we might disagree with. It's where, if you will, the rubber hits the road when we're together. When I'm at home or I'm by myself, it's amazing how worship is very similar to the way I like it. The, the songs, the hymns, the things that I like, it's all exactly what I like. The sermon is exactly the way it should be. But in the real world of the church, we bear with one another, and here's the operative, in love. Not sappy, but agape, self-sacrificial love. Wishing the best on the other person, not for anything that we can get, but because that's the model that Jesus gives us. To love without expectation of even love to be returned. The love of Jesus on the cross for the world. We are also, Paul writes, eager to maintain unity. And so then we have a teaching about unity. It's very common at, to read this during baptisms. There is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. You hear unity in that? We're called to be one, united. And then verse 7, by grace, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. See, you and I are given through the Holy Spirit the grace to do the work we're called to do. And so you look at verse 12, to equip the saints, that's us, those who are baptized in Christ, those who would boldly call themselves Christians, you and I are saints in the church of God. We're members of the body. And so to be equipped by the Holy Spirit to do the work of ministry, that's our job together. Your job as a minister, as a, as a priesthood of believers my job as a minister, as part of the priesthood of believers and the ordained priesthood, for what purpose? The exact opposite of the effects of grumbling and complaining and seeking our own way. Verse 12, for building up the body of Christ. You may remember when Bishop Salmon was our diocesan bishop, we had a, a, a sort of mission statement to build up the body of Christ for the work of the gospel. Now, our Bishop Mark has another one, but, and they're not in competition, by the way. But we are all still called to build up the body of, the Christ, uh, body of Christ for the work of the gospel, and you and I have a role to play in that. And we know that Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. That's verse 15. And so here, listen to these words. Held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, that's us. It makes the body grow, there's my food reference, so that it builds itself up in love. To build up the body of Christ for the work of the gospel. Now I'm hesitant to do this with a living human being because all of us are sinners and all of us fall short. But I want to capture one place where a living human being seems to have gotten it right. And this is present day and very real. How many of you are familiar with Sydney McLaughlin? The name is a little familiar because she is the fastest woman in the world. <laughs> she ran um, 400 meters and the hurdles in less than 52 seconds. It takes me 52 seconds to get out of bed some mornings. And she is the, one of the fastest women in the world. And here's a quote. She recently won the gold, right? Records come and go. The glory of God is eternal. I no longer run for self-recognition, but to reflect his perfect will. By grace, through faith, Jesus has given me everything. Isn't that a wonderful witness? 
Isn't that just beautiful? That's capturing, in essence, what Paul is talking about in, in, the, in, the, in the work of the church, the walk of a Christian life. And so here's an Olympian who is doing all those things that Olympians do, training. And you know, Paul uses the Olympic examples all the time in his, in his teachings. He uses real-life concrete examples. You know, run the, run the race, seek the goal, seek the prize, the wreath that doesn't perish. Olympians used to be given a wreath of laurels. But what happens to that wreath? It's the same thing that happens to the flowers. After a week or so, they're brown and wilted. And Paul says, seek the wreath that doesn't ever decay. What's he talking about? The prize of Christ being part of his body. And so today we have sort of an example in the scriptures using food, one of my favorite topics, but using it in a way that is tangible to us. And so as you and I prepare to receive the Eucharist, to receive the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ, think of it more as just a liturgical act. But as you hold out your hand, don't think, Okay, I'll take the wafer. Think of your hand being open. I'll take Jesus because he takes me. Think of it as an opportunity to open your heart once again to receive not bread and wine only, but to, re but to receive Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, to be nourished on him spiritually so that you can be truly fed and never, ever hunger or thirst ever again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to please stand. We continue on page 127 with the Nicene Creed. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people continue on page 128, and Kenneth will lead us in the prayers. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our Archbishop, for Mark our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. 
for our nation and for those in authority and for all in public service, especially for Joseph, our president, for Henry, our governor, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At this time, we invite the congregation to add additional petitions. We also invite the congregation to add thanksgivings as appropriate. Lord, I thank you for the 34th wedding anniversary for Debbie and myself. I thank you that 34 years ago we said, I do and continue to, through your grace and mercy, uh, celebrate our wedding anniversary. Thank you, Lord, for Debbie and Albert and family. Lord, we Pray for our sister Betty, for continued healing for her, for Kyle, for surgery on Friday. Pray for Angela and Bill Jr. for healing. Maureen. Are there others? Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Continuing on page 130, let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will, I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you to stand as we pass the peace from 
where we are standing. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Our offertory sentence today comes from 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. But before I give that offertory, I want to acknowledge um, our guest organist today. Thank you for playing. Scott's on vacation, and so thank you so much. Um, she's not really our guest organist, is she? She's just here all the time and, and willing to step up. And, and that's an example, by the way, of giving is to give of our talents also to the glory of God. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9 Our offertory hymn is hymn 686, verses 1 and 3. page 132 of your Book of Common Prayer with the Sursum Corda to lift up our hearts. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, 
and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Please kneel as you are able. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary he became flesh and dwelt among us, in obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. The night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him and with Him and in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Please join me with the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I invite you to join with those who are otherwise unable to receive communion at this time with the prayer for spiritual communion found on page 677 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 677 for spiritual communion. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
if you would please turn to page 137 of your Book of Common Prayer. We continue now with the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 674. 674, we pray the prayer for union with Christ. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from thee. From the wicked foe, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me, and bid me come to thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is hymn 525, the first and fifth verses.